Hey everybody, we're going to get started here in about two minutes. Just want to give everybody enough time to get logged in. We had about 70 people register for the course, so I think we might have a pretty big class today, which is exciting. Just going to give folks one more minute and then we can go ahead and jump in. All right, well, maybe actually we might just have a pretty small group today, which is absolutely fine, means you can all ask any questions you have and get them answered really quickly. Um, we got about three people out of the 60 that had registered. So let's go ahead and get started. My name's Shannon, really excited to work with you guys today, go over Concord's functionality in its entirety. Again, it's pretty short group of people. So we'll probably finish up a little bit early, probably be able to give you a little bit of your time back. One thing I just want to check before we get started is one, can everybody hear me? And two, can you see the screen? Okay. Should just be kind of this Concord 101 homepage. Perfect. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, great. Sorry, I'm just kind of checking on Zoom one last time. Just surprised it was a lot of people registering. Want to make sure I didn't do anything wrong here on my end. All right, looks like we're good. Cool. All right, so this is Concord 101. We're really going to just be covering Concord in its entirety. Class is usually about an hour to an hour and a half. 
a little longer, a little shorter, kind of depending on questions that folks have and how well I can articulate things. So what we're going to talk about today is really just the contract life cycle in terms of Concord. So we're going to go through all of this. We're going to go through drafting the contract, getting that internal approval, contract negotiation, all the way up to e-signature. We'll talk about securing the document in our repository, and then, of course, reporting and analyzing. So this, if you work with contracts, this is a life cycle list of items that you're probably fairly familiar with. But one thing that's not super well known about Concord is that it is a full CLM. So you can manage your contract from start to finish, creating it from scratch and then reporting upon that document and storing that document indefinitely in the repository. So we'll be talking about all of these different steps and how we're going to be using them within Concord. Our agenda, really we're gonna cover settings, so users and teams, folders and sharing, creating documents, collaborating in documents, going through approvals, e-signature, and then reporting. Now, one thing I just wanna mention here is that we do have a couple of different types of accounts. So most everything that I'm going to be showing you is done on the pro account. Anything that is higher than pro is enterprise, and I'll certainly make that call out. But essentially what I like to do is make sure that most everybody participating in the class is going to have functionality to these options. But again, when I do call out something that is an enterprise feature, if you don't see that within your account, it's simply just because you might be working off of standard or pro. That being said, a question that I have for you all before we really dive into Concord here is, is anybody in this session an admin? Absolutely fine if you're still unsure. Reason I ask, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is functionality that every creator within Concord could take advantage of. There are going to be a few things that are admin managed, but it is very important for all of us to understand that functionality because even though it is managed, distributed, kind of structured by our admins, it's still going to affect us every time we log into Concord. And I'll make those distinctions as well. So how long has everybody been using Concord for? Less than a week and brand new, perfect. Well, you're in the right spot. Brand new, fantastic. Sometimes we'll get people that have been with Concord for three or four years, longer than I have. So they can teach me some tricks as well. But this is great. One of the reasons it's great that you're brand new is we actually just updated our UI. So you don't have to relearn the new functionality. You get to learn it as it exists. And that's how it's gonna be staying for a very long time. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm going to hop on over into Concord here. And again, if you have questions, put them in the chat box. I'll even, we got four people. Welcome, everybody. I'm actually going to give everybody the opportunity to talk as well. So if you would like to jump in, please feel free. Usually it's a little bit harder to do in this class because it's pretty big, but we got a, a nice small crew today, which is really great. Again, you do not have to talk. You are more than welcome to. If you want to type in the chat, I have that open in a separate box too. If you don't want to say anything, absolutely fine as well. I am Boston born and raised, so I could talk all day, every day, barely stopping to take a breath. <laughs> so no pressure either way. So what we're just going to cover first is just kind of going through this homepage, navigating stuff that I'm sure you're familiar with if you've logged into Concord once, but there are a couple of distinctions that I would like to make. The first of which is what you're going to see every time you log in. So this is our homepage here. We can draft and sign contracts. We can start building our documents out, our tasks. So this is all of the documents that I have to sign. So there are three documents currently waiting for my signature. So cool feature, even if you are not, uh, excuse me, even if you are brand new to Concord, not familiar with the functionality, you can sign a document directly from this page. So if you've been instructed to sign something, click sign. 
it'll take you right to the document you can sign. So they do like to make it very simple for folks that are in Concord fairly regularly, regularly, excuse me, but also have a nice, simple, clean UI experience for folks who might just be coming in specifically to sign documents. We also have our left-hand navigation panel. We're going to spend a good chunk of time here in just a few minutes. Over to the very right-hand side, these are all links. A little bit challenging to identify that until you kind of hover over it and see that color change. But what this is going to do is just take you to your different stages of documents. So if you wanted to see all of your signed documents, you could click here as well as have this accessible count. If you wanted to see all of the documents that were currently in signing, you'd see them over here. One thing I want to also mention is that I'm working in a demo account. So I come in here pretty regularly to test things out, to run these trainings all sorts of different things. I clean it out pretty regularly. So you might have a lot more than 52 signed documents. You might have a lot more than 180 documents in total. So if you're thinking mine seems a little light, it, it absolutely is. I have to clean it up pretty regularly. Or otherwise, I end up with 40 different NDAs for a specific company. This option here, just kind of front and center, is our recently modified by anyone. So this is showing you the documents that you have access to that have been accessed by other invitees to that document within the last few days. So you can see here that a lot of work was done on Friday and a couple of days earlier than that. And then this document that I had just signed very quickly is now first because we just made a change to it. We also have our global search bar, and I'm fairly confident all of you are comfortable with running searches, but I do just want to stress what is being searched when you type the keyword into that search bar. So when you run a keyword search, it's going to be looking through the title of the document, it's going to be looking through the body of the document, and it's going to be looking through the third party field. And that exists in the contract summary. I'll, of course, show you where that exists when we dive into a contract, but just want to make it clear what Concord is looking through when you run a keyword search. You can, of course, also filter it out by stage in any tags that have been added to your documents, as well as guests that have been shared. But if you're just looking for a specific title that maybe contains the word NDA, title, body, third party. So let's come back into our documents page. So this is accessible from our homepage by selecting documents. Now it's referred to as our inbox. It's also referred to as your documents page. The intention here is to make it look very similar to that of Google Mail, Gmail, don't know why I said Google Mail, or Outlook. So the UI feels very familiar. You can log in, have a really good understanding of what needs to be done. So here are all of the documents that we have either created or that we have been shared to. We can again filter it out by stage. We can search through our own personal folder and we can look through shared folders. We're going to take a much deeper dive into shared folders in just a few moments. But the way that you want to think about these three options of inbox, personal folder, and shared folders inbox, every single thing that you have access to. Personal folder is everything that you have access to that doesn't exist in a shared folder. And a shared folder is meant to store signed documents and templates and give access to those signed documents and templates to a very specific group of people. Now, if we come into our inbox, we have a couple of different actions. So again, these are just all of the documents that I've either created or that have been shared to me. We can highlight them. We can copy them as a template. We can export this list. So exporting the list will give you an Excel document, essentially of all of these different line items with all of this information. So great for providing overview information to our stakeholders, maybe people who don't work in Concord want to be able to see what's happening in Concord, export that list. We can also download the documents if we'd like to have them on our hard drive somewhere. We can move them to separate folders that we have been given access to. We can also archive and delete. When you archive, it does not get rid of the document. 
It does not cancel any live items or notifications that you have within the document. It essentially just takes it out of sight and out of mind. So very similar to if you had archived an email. What it's going to do is still be searchable, still be live and active. If somebody responded to that email, it would pop up in your inbox. But currently it's archived, just not front and center when we log into the inbox. You can always search for archived documents by just selecting show archived. So again, very similar to just an email inbox. And when you delete items, they're not deleted for good. You still have a bit of a safety. If you come into stages, you can see all of your deleted items where you then have the opportunity to, of course, delete them for good. Or, you know what, actually, we might need these back in our inbox. Let's cancel that deletion and bring them back. So that's how you're really going to be looking for specific documents, searching for specific documents, either the search bar or your documents inbox. You can also come through into deadlines. So this is all of our date-based information being showcased to us in one succinct location. So I'm able to see anything that I need to be aware of that's occurring within the next few months. And then activity is a recently modified by anyone. So that information we saw right on our homepage is shown here. And it's going to give you a much broader understanding of actions that have been taken place, when they have taken place, and what document they have taken place to. For me, this is again a demo account, so it's really kind of just me in this platform. So you're going to see a lot of my face here. When you're working in your account, you're probably going to see a lot of actions taken by your colleagues, a lot of actions taken by any third party customers that you've invited to the document as well. We're going to put a hold on approvals and reports, as well as smart fields, because we're actually going to talk about that while we're in a document. But I do want to spend just a little bit of time going over settings. So I'm going to come into settings here. And if you are an admin, when you log in to the platform, you will see personal settings and you will see company settings. If you are not an admin, you will only see personal settings. So we're not gonna go through much of our company settings. If anybody has questions, of course, happy to answer them. We also have an admin course specifically for going through all of the functionality as an admin. Our details, my details, you can add a photo, add your name, job title, phone number, edit that information here companies this is going to be any company that you are associated with to any of you in this session today happen to know if you are working with a company that uses subsidiary management within concord it's not incredibly common but what it would allow you to do is if your company was responsible for multiple companies we have parent company a and then child company b c and d you'd be able to be shared to multiple different companies and switch between companies. So that way all of the legal documents could be kept separate by the company specifics. So if you're not sure, but you do log into companies, it's gonna show you what company you are a part of as well as what role you have. So the functions that you'll be able to perform while you're in that company. And if you are shared to multiple subsidiary companies, you'll be able to switch between them by using that settings icon coming up to the very top and saying, okay, now I wanna to go to Acme Global. Now I wanna to go to Vivanco. I'm gonna stick with the Phoenix organization for today. We also have custom messages. I love this feature. It's not super utilized, but one thing that we are all probably very aware of is that we receive a lot of notifications. We receive a lot of invites. We receive so many just templated emails from all of the collaborative platforms that we are working with. So custom messages allow you to still send out that, hey, you've been invited to a document or, hey, we're looking for your approval, but instead you can customize it. So you can make it a little bit more personal. So for example, if I'm sending out a lot of NDAs, rather than typing in the same message over and over again, I'm going to use this templated message that I've created. 
but it's still fairly personal. There are calls to action in this. If I wanted to provide additional context or say, if you'd like to schedule a meeting with me, give me a call at this phone number. So you can provide a lot more information outside of that default message when you're sending an invite to a document. So I would definitely say take some time to structure some of these out. It's going to be a big time saver for you in the long run. And then lastly, we have our preferences. So you're going to want to come into your account at some point. I know a lot of you mentioned you are brand new and just set this up because these preferences are for your account and your account only. Do you want it to be in English or French? We are pretty limited in our language options here. But you can also structure this settings to receive a deadline reminder. So let me actually show you in email what that dead excuse me that deadline reminder looks like. So once you get started using Concord, you're probably going to be shared to multiple different documents. And a lot of those documents are going to have very specific deadlines. So if you're shared to multiple documents, you don't want to have to consistently be going in and out of that document just for date based information. So with this deadline report enabled, you're able to see what's coming up within X amount of days. That X amount of days is going to be determined by this information here. The default is 180. You can change that to be longer. You can change that to be shorter. I usually keep it pretty short just to make sure that I have deadline reminder emails coming in. These are gonna be sent out every Sunday at 5 p.m. PST. So that way when you log into your work email in the morning on Monday, you'll have a really great understanding of where you might wanna focus your attention on certain contracts. This is where you can also control your email notifications. So if you want to receive an individual email for a particular action, let's say an approval was completed, we can say, let's get an individual email sent out to me. If a signature is added by a colleague or from an external guest, I want that individual email. The other option is to use this recent activity digest, which would populate a single email with all of these actions that have been taken in the last 24 hours. So it's more of a condensed report as opposed to an individual action warranting an individual email. So if you want that quick awareness, absolutely go for it. If you would prefer to have everything kind of emailed to you all at once, this recent activity digest is going to do just that. Any questions here just on personal settings? Um, yeah. My company's tab shows me as an administrator, but I don't have that company. All right, great. Menu on the side. So the company settings are restricted to admins, but there are a few functions that I'd like to call out because they are going to be things that you're running into pretty regularly. So for example, the company preferences are going to dictate you changing your passwords, potentially having a branded experience within Concord. But what you're going to definitely be aware of are users, teams, or roles, folders, and tags. So users are all of your internal colleagues that have been invited to use Concord. So if I just started the Phoenix organization and I invite three people in, I'll be able to see them here. They will be a user under the umbrella of my company within Concord. Those users can then be put into teams. So you might notice that you are already a part of a team and a team will essentially allow you to share a signed document out to multiple people at the same time. So if instead of sending it to person A, B, C, D, E, F, I can say, let's send this to the customer education team so that way they all have access to the documents that they need to. And then roles are going to be assigned to you by an admin, but they're going to dictate the functionality that you have moving forward. So you might have viewer permissions, which means you can just view documents, that's it. Collaborators can start resolving comments, they can fill in fields that have been assigned to them. 
Creators can start from scratch and they can also sign documents. And then we also have team managers and admins. So your admins are going to be structuring your accounts, adding particular settings, bringing in users to the platform. Team managers are going to be able to help the admin manage users. So you might be given one of these roles or you might have a custom role. So the custom roles are also created by admins. And what that allows you to do is have very specific functionalities. So maybe you are only able to fill in fields and comment on documents. Excellent, if that's all you need to do, makes your life a little bit easier having very specific functionality. So based on what you need to do, your admins are going to start assigning these roles to you. Now, if you feel like the role that you have doesn't allow you to do what you need to do, just go ahead and reach out to your admin, see if they can either bump your role up or if they could potentially create a custom role for you. Again, all admin managed, but definitely things that are gonna fall into the realm of work that you do within Concord regularly. Last thing that I wanna talk about here is folders and tags. So, Admins are the only individuals within Concord that can create folders. So you will likely be shared to folders. If you are an admin, you'll also be creating folders. If you have questions about folder creation, absolutely happy to talk about that with you at the end of the session or send you some resources. But since we're looking at things from a non-admin perspective, let's just go back into our document inbox for a second and take a look at folders that have been shared to me. Now, my list is fairly long because I am an admin. So I have access to every single folder. If you're not an admin, or maybe you are an admin, but you just haven't created that many folders yet, you might see one, you might see two, you might see three. So what are the intention of these folders? They are meant to store two types of items, signed documents, and templates. So let's open up this executive legal team document. And we're gonna see we have one signed document and two templates. So you're probably thinking, Shannon, that negates everything that you just said. When we think about this folder being shared out to multiple people, when Jennifer logs into this folder, she is going to see signed documents and templates. Now, she might see a couple of drafts. Maybe she might see a document in signing. But when I see this information in the folder, it is because I have created the document so I can see it in its draft stage. So when I click into this document and I open up the contract summary, it's already stored in this folder. I'm the creator, so I can see it in the folder. Nobody else can. Only people shared to the folder will be able to see this document once it's signed. Does that make sense to everyone? I know a lot of collaborative platforms work a little bit differently with folder structure. So I really just kind of like to over explain it is for signed documents and templates. Anything that you see that is in a draft stage or in a review stage is because that's a document that you have gone ahead and created yourself. All right, great. Any questions? I know this isn't the most exciting portion of <laughs> the class, just going through settings and structures and such, but any questions just up to this point? All right, perfect, I'll keep cruising then. So let's talk about creating new documents. There are going to be a few ways that you can do this. So when you go ahead and select draft and sign, you can start from a template, you can upload a document, or you can create a blank document. If you have been shared to templates, always use those because it's going to make your life so much easier. 
as opposed to building out a contract from scratch, using a template allows you to fill in some necessary information, share it out with your client, customer, third party, and go ahead and get started. So let's take a look at a template. I'm gonna use, let's see here, this sales contract. This information exists in the contract summary. I can fill it out now, I can fill it out later. And because I'm building off of a template, all of the language that needs to be built in has already built in. There can be fields built into the document. There can be approval workflows built into the document. And it's gonna save me quite a bit of time. Now, I do not have to use templates, but typically if somebody has shared you to a template, it is for compliance reasons. There is specific language that needs to be included in every sales agreement. There is specific language that needs to be included in every offer letter. So if you have access to templates, you definitely wanna make sure you're using those first. Now, of course, every contract that you create isn't going to be a templated experience. Sometimes you might be creating them on the fly. Sometimes it might be an agreement that you haven't run into before. So with that, you have two ways to create a document from scratch. We can create a blank document, which is really just using Concord as your word processor. So I could type information in here and really get started. My typing is terrible. I will warn you just right out front, it's bad. So bear with me. <laughs> the other option would be to upload a document. So the two document or file types that we accept at Concord are going to be PDFs and Word docs. And I clicked the wrong button. So let me just back up for a second. Sorry, we're gonna do draft and sign for now. Upload. And I wanna show you both PDF and Word documents because there are some differences to the editing capabilities of each. So let's start with a PDF, which means we have to use PDF. The UI is going to look very similar. I can configure signers. I can add in fields. I have access to my discussion panel, my approvals. But when it comes to the fields that I can use, it's very limited to text fields. So I don't have any paragraphs or radio buttons or anything super unique, just text. Additionally, because it's a PDF, I can't edit the text. It would essentially be the equivalent of bringing in an image. I can't edit the text here. So if you want more of a dynamic, editing experience, then I would suggest using the live editor by bringing in a Word document. Now, as I say that, there are two things to just be aware of, that when you select a Word document, you're going to have two options, live document, live editor, which is what I was using when I used create a blank document from scratch. I had all those options and then Word mode. Word mode editing capabilities is identical to that of a PDF. So what is the purpose of Word mode? Why do we have this? Word mode is meant for documents that have very complex formatting. So oftentimes when you build out a document within Microsoft Word, you can have all of these images, text that is specific to your brand guide, indentations, bullets, numbering, just all sorts of actions that have been taken to make the document look a specific way. And when you upload that document into any third party, not even just Concord, you do run that risk of having it be a bit skewed. So if that is not something that you can accept when you bring in a third document, excuse me, when you bring in a third party document, excuse me, you can use word mode, which guarantees it will keep all of that visual work that's been done in Microsoft Word identical to how it would exist in Concord. The only caveat, I guess caveat is the right word. I don't, I don't wanna say downside because you do get that branding, but one thing to just be mindful of here is that very similar to that of the PDF, we can only bring in text fields. And of course we can't make any direct edits because similar to the PDF, we're bringing in essentially an image of what we had in Microsoft Word to Concord. 
So great options. I'll be honest, most people 99% of the time are going to use that live editor, just because you have a lot more tools for negotiating with your invitees. But I like to call out both options because sometimes you have to work with a PDF. Sometimes you might be bringing in a third party paper that's heavily formatted. So it's really nice to know that those tools are available to you. So let's return home one more time. Let's draft and sign. And I'm going to upload a document. I know um, all of you in this class are actually new to the platform. So I have a lot of these just templates that I can use when I'm running tests or I want to demo something. If you are looking for something similar, because you just want maybe a document to play around in, have kind of a sandbox contract to work with, if you go to concordnow.com and then select resources and template center, there are a bunch of templates that you can use. You can bring them into practice, or if you are really kind of as I am doing, just looking for sandbox, you can use these as well. So you would just select view template, download, accept, download, and then you're good to go. So I always like to show this off. Not a lot of people know that it's an option, but also certainly makes things a lot easier if you want a realistic looking contract just to test out. So let's actually go ahead and use this one. I'm just going to drag and drop it in. And we're going to use a live document. Again, this information exists in the contract summary. I'm going to create. And let's get started. So I'm going to take you through kind of just the typical flow that you would want to use when creating a document. Does this have to be the flow that you use? Absolutely not. I've just found it works for me, works for a lot of other customers. But we're going to talk about all of the functionality. This is just usually how I get started. So the first thing I want to do is just change this title because this is a mess. One thing you might remember is when we were looking at all of my documents, it was probably very annoying to a lot of you because I had five or six documents all titled just a random jumble of letters and numbers, or I had 15 different contracts all titled NDA. So when we're searching, it makes it really challenging. And when we're looking through our inbox, it looks very unorganized. So what we typically suggest is to have a pretty standardized naming convention among your team. So what that looks like is completely up to you, but I'm going to show you a very common naming convention for titles. And two reasons for this. One, it makes searching for your documents a lot easier. Two, it's a lot cleaner. So what I like to do is put the type of agreement it is. So we're just going to say digital marketing agreement. I like to put who it's with. So this is going to be the customer that I'm working with. Again, typing is terrible. I'm sorry, guys. And then when I expect it to be executed. So this is going to be signed in May 2022. Gives us a lot of information right out front, very clean, very organized. I've seen people use something very similar to this. Sometimes people will include the purchase order in the title, whatever works for you, but not a bad idea just to have it standardized amongst your team. So now that we've got the title input, I also want to add additional information because if this is a contract that's going to last for three years, the information that I'm getting today is probably going to be very challenging to recall three years from now. So any data that I can just dump into this document to help later me out, I'm going to do that. And that's when this contract summary comes into play. So all of this information is going to be visible to internal team members. So I'm the only person on the document right now, but if I do share it out to any of my colleagues, they'll be able to view this as well. It will not be visible to my third parties. So if I add a description about the Maxwell organization that says, you know, small company CEO has been there for six months, it's nothing terrible, but might just want to be something that we're keeping internal. So I'm going to enter this third party information. You'll remember this is one of the fields I mentioned that becomes searchable when you're running searches on the document. I'm going to give a description. Maybe the Maxwell Inc. is a dog food company in Utah, first state I could think of. Now we can also add tags to the documents. So tags are admin generated. It's a 
pre-approved a list of keywords that you can attach to documents. The benefit of attaching these keywords to documents is it's going to loop all of your contracts together by commonality. So if this is a contract that is bringing us 200 to 250 K in revenue, I'm going to attach this tag to it. And what I'll later be able to do is run a search off of this tag or run a report off of this tag. And it's going to show me all of my documents that I have access to that are bringing in 200 to 250 K. You, depending on your role, might have the opportunity to not only add tags to documents, but to create tags. So what I would be very cautious of if you do have that capability is making sure you don't have any duplicate tags. So let's say I want to tag this with marketing. We have department and then we have marketing. I can create a tag that is still called marketing department. Now, both of these tags are meant to represent the same thing, but if there are two different options, 50% of our documents are probably going to be tagged with option one, 50% are going to be tagged with option two, which means when we run our reports, we're not going to get the most realistic results because some of them are going to be hanging out under this tag. So just try to make sure that you don't have any duplicates if you do have the permission to add tags. So I'm going to save this here. And again, this is information that's going to exist as long as the contract exists. I can also link this to another document. So maybe we had an initial NDA signed with the Maxwell Incorporation. We can say, I want this document to be linked to that NDA. Just so we're very aware of the multiple documents that we have with a certain company. And then the personal folder is by default where your items are saved. If I wanted to store this in a separate folder, I could. And as soon as this particular contract was fully executed, everybody that had access to the marketing team document, excuse me, the marketing team folder would have access to this document. We're also going to want to put in life cycle information. So if all of our digital marketing agreements last for a period of a specific amount of time for a permanent duration unknown, we can add that. Any date-based information that you include in your summary is going to be what triggers those notifications, those reminders, those deadline emails to you for additional context. So if you don't wanna to have to consistently manually check your documents, if you add date-based information, Concord will send you those reminders. You can also add an effective date. So let's say we agree to it becoming effective on May 18th, and you can add a renewal period and a notification of non-renewal. So we'll say one month. All that information is stored. Now, this information, the width, the description, the tags, that's all native to the summary. That might not be the only information that is important for you to capture. So you can also add your own fields. Maybe you wanna add the CEO name of the Maxwell Incorporation. So we'll say his name is Maxwell. Smith, we could say maybe we need a phone number. Again, pardon the typing. It's instances like this where I really am confronted with just how badly I need glasses. And this is information that will, of course, also be stored indefinitely with the contract, but it's custom. And then lastly, we have clauses. So if you need to add a clause to your document, you can. These also have the opportunity to include a duration or frequency and a financial amount. So let's say that we came to an agreement with the Maxwell Corporation because they're spending so much money with us, we're happy to take payments on a monthly basis as opposed to upfront. I'm gonna call this our monthly payment. And you know, we'll say it's gonna be $1,000 a month. We're gonna add in a duration or frequency, and we're gonna say it's a reoccurring event that happens every one month. And I wanna say it starts at the start of the contract, which we have already added, 518. And then it ends at the end of the contract. And then let's add that financial amount as well. 
we're going to say to be paid is a thousand dollars. We'll use US dollars because this is a Salt Lake City company we're working with, and we'll say before tax. This date based information will also be included in our deadline reminders and any sort of reminder that we've structured for ourselves. All right. So contract summary does take a little bit of time to fill out, but six months from now, when this contract has been executed, I'm probably not going to remember these fine details, but they will be stored in Concord indefinitely. So that's going to be super helpful. Now that I have this information input, what I'm probably going to want to start doing is making edits to the document. So I haven't shared it out with anybody yet, but what do I want to get ready for this document? So it looks like there's a couple of placeholders here for fields. It looks like there are signature panels for me to start adding signatures. So what I'm going to do is start thinking about the information that I need to be collecting from who I'm executing this agreement with. So once I'm in edit mode, I can start adding fields. So what I'm going to do here is assign these fields to anyone. So anyone shared to the document can fill this out. Can I change this later? Absolutely. We're going to add a short answer. So we just drag and drop, drag and drop, drag and drop, and drag and drop. Now, if I wanted to change the placeholder from short answer to something else, I click into the field, type it in. and so on and so forth. By default, your fields are required. So that means before we can fully sign the agreement, somebody's got to fill this out because the audience is anyone. We can also change our intended fillable by at any point. Now, let's say that there is information that needs to be collected from my team. I'm going to assign that as internal because I don't want external to be able to fill that out. So I'm gonna bring in some smart fields and smart fields are pre-generated fields by your admins. So instead of you having to create them from scratch, your admins do, and they're also dynamic. So I'm gonna bring in our actual cost. I'm also gonna bring in, let's say the date. And let me show you something as well that is pretty interesting. Let's use external initials. Let's say there are a couple of locations that I'm going to want my external guests to sign their initials. I'm going to add it here. I'm going to add it here. And I'm going to add it here. When you use a smart field, one, super fast because it's already been created for you, but two, they're dynamic. So we have three smart fields of the same name in the document. When our third party fills out one singular field, it's gonna to update to all of the other fields. So for things like name, full name, date, initials, things that your customers are consistently filling out over and over and over again, the smart field allows them to only fill it out once and it will auto-populate to all of the other fields of the same name. Now, if I wanted to assign a field to a specific person, they have to be added as a signatory first. So I can come in and add signers at any point. So let's say that I'm gonna add myself as a signer, and I'm also gonna add Maxwell. Now you'll notice I added Maxwell as a signatory, but he's not shared to the document yet. So this is a really unique feature because I might still wanna make a couple of edits, maybe add a few additional fields before sharing the document out to Maxwell. So they get placed in a bit of a holding pattern and then I can invite the dumb, excuse me, I can invite them to the document when I'm ready by clicking send invitation. So if you want to establish them as a signatory just so you can start assigning fields to them, absolutely. And then when you are ready to share them out to the document, you just click that send request button. So we filled out our summary. We have our signatories. So these are ultimately the individuals who are going to be signing the document. Let's talk about our discussion panel. 
So our discussion panel allows us to have conversations within the document, and they will be stored indefinitely as well, which is very helpful because if we were having discussions, let's say on price, if we were having discussions, let's say on who is going to be responsible for moving forward with the contract after signatories, all of that information will be tracked here. So I can say, you know, Shannon is main contact during execution after you'll call Jason. I can post this publicly or internally. Public means anyone shared to the document can read it. Internal means only colleagues. I have not invited any colleagues to the document. So public would allow Max and myself to see it. Internal would allow just me. Once you post the discussion, it cannot be deleted. It cannot be edited. So make sure you're very comfortable with your audience and make sure you are comfortable with the words that you are saying because they cannot be changed. They cannot be taken away. What I'd like to do is also set up signature fields for myself and for Maxwell. So we have two options. We can create our own signature blocks or we can use a preset signature block. So a preset signature block means when I request the signature, their company, their title, and their signature itself will end up down here. What you'll also notice is that we also have a pre-created signature block above the page. So oftentimes when you have very specific paper that you need to bring in from a customer or a client, you're probably going to want to use what they provided to you as opposed to this preset signature block. So you don't have to enable this. It is just an option. If you choose not to use the preset signature block, the only thing we just need to make sure of is that our signatories have a place to e-sign because right now there is no location for them to do that. So if we come back into edit mode and we open up our fields, I'm going to select myself and I can add additional fields that are required of me. And I can also add signer fields. Now, without that preset signature block, the only option under signer fields I am required to include is a space for me to sign the document. The full name, title, and company are just added for our convenience. So if I wanted to collect this information in conjunction with e-signature, which is fairly common, instead of having to build them out myself, I can just drag and drop them in. Now I have this for myself. I'm probably going to want it also for Maxwell. So let's assign Maxwell. And let's bring in his signature. Company and his full name. And if we wanted city, state, and zip or date, we could always use a short answer and customize it to fit this need. But now that they have a place to sign, we're good to go. One final trick I just kind of want to show you in terms of structuring the e-signature fields is a table. So this particular document, when we brought it in, already had very specific locations for e-signature. So it was very easy for me to say, okay, I'm going to drag and drop it here, here, and here. Not every document that you create is going to have that, and formatting can be a pain. Because if I'm coming in here, let's add a few fields. Let's say I want to add this here, and then I want to add this kind of over to the right-hand side. It's going to require a lot of finagling with our indentation, which not everybody wants to spend a good chunk of their time doing, more than fair. So what you can also do is add a table. So I'm gonna add a table that is four by two. And then I'm just gonna expand it so it looks a little nicer. And then I can just drag and drop these fields into the table so it has that very clean, concise look. Now, would we need two of these? Absolutely not. I'm just showing this in case this is something that you would like to test out as you start creating your documents and building out your signature. Here we go. Any questions on just fields or adding signatories?
All right, perfect. So we've got the text the way that we like it. We've added all of the fields for information that we would like to collect. We have a location for our signers to sign. We could go ahead and request signatures right now, but we did give Maxwell editor permissions. So we're probably going to want that person to negotiate the contract with us. As opposed to having multiple different meetings, we can negotiate this contract in real time. So we give Maxwell editor permissions, which means theoretically they could come in and they could add text. They could delete text. They could make changes, which is great. That's what we want them to do. And with only Max and myself on this contract, it's pretty easy to identify changes that have been made. But you're probably going to be working on multiple contracts at the same time. And some of those contracts are going to have a lot of different users making changes. So what I would suggest doing is turning on your track changes. When you turn on track changes, watch what happens. If I delete this text, there's going to be a visual indication that an edit has been made, but I internally have to either accept or decline. So Maxwell's able to make their changes, but internally we can say, okay, we accept it or no, we reject. You also have access to version history. Every time somebody saves the document, a new version is created. So let's say that I forgot to turn on track changes and Maxwell deleted the whole document and hit save. <laughs> what we could do is say, all right, let's come back to that first version we had. And we can either restore it or we can export it. If we restore it, this is the version we would then be working off of moving forward. So every time you hit save, a new version is stored. Is there a way to allow one outside party to read, collaborate on a contract, but not a different party like a client? Anyone that you invite to the document would be able to collaborate or view depending on the permission that you give to them. So for example, outside, if you wanted to have a legal consulting person, you would just share the document to them and you can give them viewer, editor, or limited editor permissions. The only way that a additional client would be able to collaborate on the same document would be if you invited them. So when it comes to external users, you can invite as many external users to a document as you would like, but the only way an external user will have access to a document is if you invite them directly. Not sure if I understood what you were asking, so if I missed the mark completely, do feel free to tell me. Just wanna make sure I, I understand correctly. Sometimes it takes me a couple minutes to get there. <laughs> Okay, gotcha, perfect. Uh, the recording will be shared after this call, yes. Someone just said uh, they have to drop off early. So yep, you'll get an email uh, usually in a day or two. Excellent. All right, so we've got our fields, we've got everything going. One final option we have in terms of collaboration outside of fields, outside of discussions, outside of editing the document itself is commenting. So the commenting functions very similarly to that of Google Docs or Microsoft Word. You highlight the text, you click the comment button, and we say, hey, this is unclear. Can someone edit? 
we have two audiences. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have just one second. Sorry. We have two audiences very similar to the discussion panel, public or internal. Public means that somebody shared to the document can read it. Internal means only internal colleagues can read. Very similarly to that of discussions, once it's posted, cannot be edited, the audience cannot be edited. So that is, again, just something to be mindful of. Make sure you're confident with what you're writing. Make sure you're comfortable with the audience. Even when it's resolved, the comment becomes hidden, but it's not gone for good. When you come into your audit, we have all of the important actions that have been taken within the document listed. But we also have an audit of our comments. Now, both parties are able to see this information. So if it was public, they'd have access to the public comments. If it was internal, of course, they would not be able to see that information. All right. So one final thing I wanna talk about here is approvals. So let's go ahead and add an approval. So you have access to two types of approvals, company approvals and custom approvals. Company approvals were created by admins. So they are essentially saying that for every consulting contract, add this approval workflow. For every sales approval, add this workflow. And what it's going to do is require that we get approval from Shannon and Jason. And then when they approve, it's gonna go off to the HR team. For this particular sales agreement, starts with Shannon, then goes to Jason. We can go ahead and add this to our document and select save. Now, when we are ready to start this approval process, oh, let me find one that doesn't have me on it. Give me one second. Let's use this one because it's not myself. There we go. When you're ready to request approval, the reason that I didn't have to request approval was because I was the first step. So I'm not gonna request it from myself. I can either just give it or not give it. But because this isn't coming to myself for an approval, we have to request. Now we can either request with a message or we can request with a template message. When you request with a message, not a bad idea to say, hey, Jason, do you agree with everything that's in here? If so, feel free to approve. If not, let us know what edits you want made. Once we request the approval from this person, if they haven't been shared to the document, they will be automatically shared to the document because of course they need to be able to view it. And then we wait on their approval. We cannot request signature until we have their approval. So we would not be able to execute this contract fully until we receive this approval from the appropriate person. Now let's take away this approval here because I'd like to showcase one other approval and that would be custom. So let's say your admins did not structure approvals for you, but you know for a big contract like this, we do need to get approval from the CEO. I can create my own and I can say for this, I wanna get approval from Jason, our CEO, and that's it. We can add another step if we wanted to, or we can do a conditional step. So conditional step is like an if then statement. So if this happens, then I want approval from a specific person. And your conditions are based off of smart fields. So we have these smart fields in the document. So let's use actual cost. And I'm gonna say, if the actual cost is greater than or equal to 500,000, can't tell if I have enough zeros. Nope, one more. <laughs> then I need to get approval from Jason. So instead of bombarding them with little approvals for small contracts, we're only gonna approve it when it's very big. So we're gonna hit save. And we're gonna notice that there is no approval required, but let's go ahead and put in that amount. So we'll do 650,000. And then as soon as we save it, we're gonna to need to kick off that approval process because that condition has now been met. Now, Jason's actually not a real person, so we'll be waiting a very long time for his approval. So I'm just gonna remove it. 
One final thing that you can do in terms of settings for approval is you can say automatically notify next approver when a step is complete. So if it's a multi-step approval, once step one is done, it automatically kicks off the request to the second and the third, and you can allow external guests to sign at any time. So even if it hadn't been approved internally, our external guests could still sign the document if they wanted to. We're just gonna take this off. Now, there is one final thing that would bar us from requesting signatures. And that would be if we had unresolved edits. So if we have an approval workflow that has not been met, and if we have an unresolved edit, we cannot move forward with the contract. So let's decline this and let's move this from review into signing. Now I'm gonna request signatures and it's gonna lock the editing. So when we think about editing, what that means is adding text, adding fields, deleting text, we can still fill out fields that are required. So let's find these two, this external initials. These are locked because they've been assigned to Maxwell and not me. So I can't fill them out. Whatever I can fill out is going to be open and available for me to edit. So I fall under the bucket of anyone. So those fields that have been assigned to anyone can be completed by me. What I have to do before I can sign is fill out fields that were assigned to me specifically. So I can fill out the anyone fields or I can simply just say, I'm gonna fill out only the fields that were assigned to me and I'm gonna sign the document and move on. So let's just go through, fill out some of these fields. Feel like there's a couple more in here. Don't want to miss them. We'll add the date. These are locked because they're from Maxwell. My full name, my company. And it looks like I'm missing one field. Here it is. I forgot that we had that extra signature block. So now that I'm ready to sign, I'm gonna go ahead and click on sign. But what it's saying is, hey, there are still empty fields. Are you sure you're comfortable with signing? Is my signature contingent upon Maxwell's initials? No, so I can't continue to sign. If it was important information and I wanted to wait until Maxwell provided that information into the fields, I could cancel and then sign when I was ready. Now, because there are required fields, you cannot sign the document until all of your assigned fields that are required have been completed. So if I were to delete this information here, I'm no longer going to be able to sign the document. So anything that is assigned to you and required, you have to complete before you can sign the document. The benefit to signing the document when you're done with your fields is you don't have to wait for somebody else. So if Maxwell is taking his sweet time filling out his fields, I can still sign the document after completing my fields. So it gives us a lot more authority over our own timelines when editing and adding information to the contract. Now, let's say that these anyone fields were not completed. There are two things that could happen. One, Jason could come in and fill them out because he has editor access and he falls into the bucket of anyone. Or two, I sign the document There we go. Jason comes in and completes them, or Maxwell comes in and completes them. If Maxwell is ready to sign the document, he will have to complete these any one fields until, excuse me, before he is able to sign the document. 
So the way that it works, in case you were curious about those fields that might be assigned to an internal user or an external user or anyone, who is responsible for filling them out? Because if they're required, we need that information. The person who is last to sign that falls into that bucket will be required to complete that field before they can sign. So for example, because Maxwell falls into the anyone bucket, when they are ready to sign, they will be required to complete these because they are the last available anyone before they sign the document. If it was assigned to an internal user, the last internal user to sign would be required to complete it before they could sign the document. So it's always going to make sure that you get the information you need. It's just going to either fall to the last person if nobody else has filled it out, or your internals, your externals, or your anyone's will fill it out at any time. But if it hasn't been completed by the time that last signer rolls around, that last signer is going to be responsible for it. Now we see my signature, we're of course just waiting on Maxwell's. Maxwell is another fake person. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do here is just finalize the signing. This is not something that you would need to do. This is going to remove Maxwell as a signer as well as all of his fields that are empty. And the only reason I'm doing this is because there's a couple of things that I would like to show you that you have access to once a document is signed. So once the document has been finalized, so realistically, we would have waited for Maxwell. But once a document is fully signed or executed, you can download the signature certificate. Now, I want to make it very clear that your e-signature is legally binding. When you download a PDF of the document, that is proof of your legally binding e-signature. But if you want additional compliancy information in regards to your e-signature, the signature certificate, excuse me, will provide that. So it shows you the audit. It shows you how many pages, how many signature fields, shows the IP address of the users that have signed the document. So just additional information should you need it. All right, before we kind of move on to the last bit, any questions on anything that we've covered up to this point? All right. Well, just a couple final things to show you here. Some, uh, excuse me, since you mentioned, uh, this group mentioned that you're fairly new to Concord, you probably have documents that have been executed outside of Concord. So you might have a document that was signed a month ago and is still valid for another 11 months. Now, rather than keeping that in a separate location with Concord, you have an unlimited repository. So you can store as many documents in Concord as you need. Now, some of them might be old. They might be a contract from 1995 that you've uploaded to make it searchable. Some of them might have been signed two weeks ago. All you need to do is select that new signed document, browse, find that document in either PDF or Word document formatting, open it up, and create the document. Now, you won't be able to edit it, of course, because it's already been executed. However, you will be able to add summary information. If it's a contract that was signed two weeks ago, we can say, hey, it was signed in April and it's valid for another year. So now you're going to start receiving notifications about this document, even though it was signed outside of Concord. Concord's going to remind you because you've put that information in. And because you have that unlimited repository, you still have that opportunity to search for documents that were added. You can create reminders and deadlines for documents. And it allows you to have that single source of truth for all of the contracts that you are responsible for. 
So certainly makes things very helpful to be able to keep things in one singular location. Um, and it doesn't cost anything extra to use the repository. So I always say just take advantage of it, right? Certainly going to make things a lot easier to run a quick search on the Maxwell Inc. as opposed to, you know, scouring the eighth floor's filing cabinets to find a particular contract. All right. Well, I've been talking to you guys for almost an hour and a half. Um, so I'd love to open it up for questions or thoughts, or if there was something you wanted us to cover today that we did not I'd like to hand it over to you and get your thoughts. Also, if you are all concorded out, that's fine too. Feel free to drop off. Thank you guys so much for joining today and trusting me with a bit of your work day. Alrighty, well, if there aren't any questions, I'm going to go ahead and close us out. Thank you guys again so much for joining, and I look forward to crossing paths with you again soon. Have a good one, everybody.